want to be in charge and do bad things. And to do that, they've got to dumb you down. But what is going to stop them is courage. And Sebel Edmonds was an FBI uh, high security clearance translator and because she can speak Arabic and several other languages. And she was listening before, during, and after 9-11. And she went to Congress and told them what she knew, and they gagged her. She pretty much broke the gag order. Incredible courage. You've seen the persecution of whistleblowers the last few years. We even exposed crime. And they... Um, you know, basically uh, threatened her and things, but but she hasn't been thrown in jail. Ladies and gentlemen, it takes a lot of courage to go up against these people. Most men I know will not do it. They won't even admit this is going on, but uh, C. Bell Edmonds did that. We'll give you her website. Uh, I, I'm on the road. I'm pulling up a story she really wants us to look at, so we'll let her break that here. We've got riding shotgun uh, Jakari Jackson and David Knight. They'll be hosting the whole next hour, and they're going to have Syrian girl on breaking down the fact they're trying to frame them for chemical weapons. But I have to say to C. Uh, Bell, because I heard her on um, TV a few days ago, or saw her on TV. We linked to it from RT. Uh, with Abby uh, Martin, excellent piece, going over the fact that this could be a false flag. Could be. I mean, knowing what she knows, I'm not going to recap it all, but we know this. The FBI, CIA was on these guys for five years. It's now confirmed mainstream news in Europe, in Russia, that he was in a CIA-sponsored Zbigniew Brzezinski program to, to undermine the caucuses where they're putting al-Qaeda in. This is a total setup. And this is, this is a message to all the patsies out there, people that think you're part of national security stuff. You're playing the part of a terrorist to infiltrate groups. You're going to be set up a lot of times. Uh, and, and, and the little brother was just tagging along. He was partying the night before. He had no idea. They've cut his throat out. Uh, he, he climbed out of the boat, and they tried to kill him. He's been told, you're dead if you don't play ball. Same thing happened with McVeigh. They do the same thing over and over again. That's how I'm able to tell you what's going to happen. I had Richard Belzer on when it was announced, and I said, there'll be a drill. The people will be handled. They'll set up patsies that openly work for intelligence groups. People are like, how did you know this, Jones? People are so freaked out right now. They're saying, you know, that Jones must be a government agent or something. Well, if I am a government agent, we need more like me. No, I'm not. I'm a liberty lover who studied what they do. It's so pathological. Now, Sibel Edmonds has been a total insider and a real government agent that went public. And she has a news website that we're going to put on screen for TV viewers and let her plug uh, here on air. But, uh, uh, Sibel, I want you to, to, to take the floor here. Then my reporters have a few questions for you at the next segment. And talk about your case briefly to recap it. And then what did you think the minute you saw the Boston bombing because I know being a false flag expert someone who's covered it for 15 16 years uh, th actually longer than that but I really been on it since Oklahoma City so I guess 18 years uh, this is like flashbacks for me it's very painful I wish this wasn't an inside job because that's a lot less scary than you know to, to have a few lone nuts out there than to know that the system is this corrupt and then why would they do it a uh, Seabell thank you for so much for joining us Hi, Alex. Good to be with you again. And uh, as far as my uh, case is concerned, I'm not going to get into the civil liberties and the details of my case. But I want to emphasize the fact that since my case broke in 2002 with all the state secrets, privilege and gag orders, I have been emphasizing the gist, the reason for the state secrets, privilege uh, and also the gag orders being our operation, and this is our, us, the United States government's operations in Central Asia and Caucasus. Some direct operations also through proxy nations such as NATO member Turkey in this region. And that includes all the stands, you know, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, but also in the Caucasus, Chechnya, Dagestan. And uh, so this has been pretty much a consistent uh, theme for the past 10 years with my case. And every time I have given an interview or talk about it, uh, people go like, oh, Stan, Central Asia, Caucasus, even people- No, you always bring that up because that's what you were listening to. And this is part of the public program in that Red Crescent to, to, to destabilize that. This is a public program. What is incredible is that it's all public, but the public's so ignorant, it's like we're speaking Martian. Oh, well, a lot of it, Alex, you say it's public uh, info, but the mainstream media has really never, ever, ever covered this. And a lot of the pseudo alternatives that you know about, I know about, our listeners know about, they never touch these regions. But now, lo and behold, uh, with this incident uh, in, in Boston, suddenly it put this region, the Caucasus, Chechnya and Dagestan on the map. 
And, you know, these people went from freedom fighter rebels overnight with Boston incidents into the hottest terrorist cell, hottest Al-Qaeda terror cell, hottest Islamic radical cell, parroting each other, getting their script from the State Department, from, from the CIA, especially the New York Times and, and L.A. Times, uh, Washington Post, but also to a certain degree, a lot of these quasi-alternative media. And I know a lot of people, they got bogged down with all these ever-changing, ever-conflicted, uh, contradictory semantics and details. But the bottom line is these guys were working for Western intelligence. The Russians blew their cover. For people that don't know, you've been saying publicly for 10 years since you broke the gag order uh, with a lot of courage, as I said earlier, that it was a crime network from Central Asia right through the stands, right into uh, the Caucasus, right into Albania right into southern Europe, eastern Europe, right into... So explain the big picture, because you were on the well, inside listening to all this. Explain to people what's happening here on the Brzezinski Grand Chessboard, and then how that fits into these brothers. Sure. So as I was saying, while people were bogged down with all these ever-changing information, which is, in a way, it's a matter of distraction. People, you know, making a lot of, uh, you know, putting out a lot of hypotheses and talking about some details on the ground, we came out as Boiling Frog's post and we talked about the bigger picture. And that's exactly what the U.S. government, that's what exactly the mainstream media don't want people to look at, to step back and look at the big picture. Number one, the fact that they were from uh, this region, you know, with connections to Chechnya, Dagestan. These are not even nations. These are regions within Russian territory and Russia. And the other thing I talked about, of course, the, the interview you referred to was a good interview with Abby Martin but was very short, so I really couldn't get into it. And that's why we have a much longer interview from five days before that on our website when I get to explain. For example, one of the things that keep coming out of the parents for the suspects were that, you know, this thing dated back to three to five years ago. And while FBI was talking about two years, you know, Russians notifying the FBI at the end of 2011. The other inconsistency that is very important, and I'm going to link it to this great game uh, in a second, had to do with the style that the parents were talking talking about the style of the uh, communication relationship of these government officials with the suspects. Right away, I said, first of all, that seems to be the recruitment style, you know, especially if it dated three to five years ago. And considering these guys, especially the older brothers, language, linguistic skills, you know, he speaks Russian, Chechen, the Turkic language, and English. He still Yeah, for people that passport. don't know, they come to like, you know, they come to people when they're like 16, 17, 18, this is five years ago, and say, you are powerful. You're a leader. The CIA needs you to infiltrate these groups. So you get these party animals, suddenly you're going to mosques saying, I want to blow everyone up. They're, they think they're finding radical Muslims, but really they're creating the ledger and the history to be set up. Well, I would be careful to characterize it as infiltrating because when you're talking about these groups, Alex, and this goes to my case and this goes to what I've been referring to for the past 11 years, well, these groups are our groups. We, the United States, created these groups, okay? Oh, no, 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 no. I, I totally agree with you. It's on record the State Department runs the Islamic terror groups, all of them in the stands. You're the expert, but, but, but I mean, that's all admitted. You're misunderstanding. I'm saying when they sent the brothers around to shoot their mouths off at mosque, about how they, you know, how they hate America and stuff, and, and, and then they go party at the dorm at night. That is clearly them thinking their agents infiltrating radical groups is what I'm saying, when in truth they're creating their history, their ledger to be set up later. No, I understand. And one of the other things I need to emphasize right here at this point is Initially, when the report came out, there were a lot of people who said, well, these guys only associated with modern, you know, wealthy Turkish students and businessmen there. And we didn't see any uh, signs of radicalization. They were hanging out in BMWs, going to nightclubs. And now you're referring to this thing of some of these people coming and saying this is what they said in the mosque. That's why I haven't been really covering all these changing contradictory details, because after it's eight, a nine screen. days, we can get a lot of people exactly, you're right, to come and say. And, and okay, then I'm going to shut up. And listen, here's what I'm going to do. Then, then you've got the floor. What is the core <laughs> of this and what people need to know? Go ahead. Well, Alex, this really makes me feel special. You're giving me the floor. I'm really honored. Thank you. Uh, 
so what I pointed out, the fact that, okay, these people are exact profile that CIA seeks, especially in the United States, we don't have many people from caucuses. So the older brother is a perfect operative for the CIA to recruit. That was the number one thing uh, we put out through our website and say, nobody's talking about the CIA connection. Everybody's putting the focus on FBI. And, and I believe that the Russians did in fact contact the FBI at the end of 2011. FBI went there, they came back, and they were told by the CIA to butt out, to zip, and not to close the case. Because while I was working at the FBI with the agents on these operations, this was a recurring uh, theme, Alex. We would have a lot of investigations. We would open up. We would, uh, you know, pursue suspects. And lo and behold, either the State Department, and again, I have been saying this for 11 years, or CIA would step in and would pressure the SES level people, the top tier level people in the FBI, to shut down the investigations, to close the investigations, because whatever we were looking at or whoever we were looking at happened to be, uh, our guys from the CIA and State Department side. So, and this went to a lot of 9-11 related cases where uh, we had actively, just in my own department alone, several cases where the CIA came and said, you're gonna shut this investigations and you're not gonna pursue this person or actually CIA facilitated the suspects exit from the country, from the United States immediately weeks after 9-11. So that was very similar. The other thing that I kept telling people to look at is what is going to happen immediately after this terror incident, the so-called scripted uh, terror incident. I said, watch three areas very carefully, and this is what you're going to be seeing. And guess what? In the past two days, what we put out a week ago saying this is what's going to take place is already in effect. It's already taking place. Number one, I said, well, the biggest obstacle uh, for us to go and actually directly invade Syria because we have the military power. We can take it. We can take them out in two days. OK, go to Syria and get rid of Assad and do this and finish it. Invade a la Libya, you know, a la Egypt. But I said the only obstacle has been Russia. Now, with this connection, suddenly we changing hats saying, well, these guys that we created for a while, we are going to declare them the terrorists, the hot Al-Qaeda cell. Look, again, we have done this throughout the history with Mujahideen that we created, Al-Qaeda, uh, bin Laden in Afghanistan. At some points, they were our freedom fighters. They were our guys. At some point, they were terrorists. And sometimes we do it several times. KLA, okay, in the Balkans with Albanians. We, deeply, we have KLAs under terrorist category with the State Department. Then during the Balkan War, we made them the freedom fighters, our allies. We lift that terrorist title. And then after we were fi finished, we were done, we put that title back again. We do this a lot with, and same thing with MEK, the Mujahideen uh, al Some people refer to them as MKO. Now look at Chechens, right? Suddenly Chechens are the terrorists and all these bad guys. Do you know who's the biggest lobby for the Chechens? In several years ago, they established a Chechen lobby. Guess who established it? James Woolsey, ex-CIA director. Michael Ladin, Frank Gaffney, Richard, Richard Pearl. When you look at the names of these lobbyists that set up this, uh, the Committee for Peace in Chechnya, okay, the American Committee for Peace in Chechnya, a lobby group for Chechens, you're looking at all the infamous CIA, DIA Pentagon, and the neocons, okay? Later, after it got a little bit scandalous, they changed the Chechnya in the title into Caucasus, the American Committee for Peace in Caucasus, right? The, this is not even a nation we are talking about, Chechnya. And now we have this big group, lobby group, with all the CIA and neocon guys for Chechnya sure. and Chechens. People have to ask this. So this is what, you know, what happens now. I pointed out that there is a possibility that we made a backdoor deal with the Russians, okay? Look, step aside and let us go and invade Syria directly, okay? For a while, we'll declare the Chechen and these guys in Dagestan as the most radical Al-Qaeda terrorists. Overnight, okay? We'll set it up. We'll script it for you. And we'll give you the free hand because Russia has been 
pretty much uh, wary of really tackling some of these cells within its own regions. Because if you look at the map, you see that the region is very close, right on the border of Georgia. Now, recall that conflict in 2008, the five-day war with between Georgia and Russia. So it's a very volatile region. Plus, Russia, people are like, well, Russia doesn't need permission from the United States, but you have to look at the geopolitics and you it also have to- It needs the political cover. It, they need the exactly. political cover. Look, Russia doesn't want that kind of a bad rep when the EU, the United States says, look, Russia is repressing these minorities. They are committing genocide. So they have been kind of wary, even though their intelligence have all the stuff, uh, information on these cells. Sure, we're about to go to break. Really Let me just throw this question at you, and then we can come back and you can have the floor continually sure. and, and finish up sure. these important points you're making. Why would then the Georgian government, along with the Russians, release their military, the documents that he's at the CIA Jamestown-funded, Woolsey-controlled, Zbigniew Brzezinski-controlled meetings, uh, why would Georgia, I know it's moving a little bit uh, away from the West now, but why would Georgia do that? I mean, they're obviously upset about this. So what does it signify? Uh, because the, we produced this video report and an hour in depth interview on this. And during this interview, uh, I pounded the issue and I said, I'm really asking for some factions within the Russian government intelligence and Georgia to put out information because their intelligence for years, for more than two decades, have been wow. collecting all, all our operations. Wow, you did do that, South absolutely, CIA so stay there. NATO. Hi, Ted Anderson, president of Midas Resources. With over 30 years of experience in the precious metals business, I can tell you without a doubt, we are facing the most dangerous and volatile times, not just in the United States, but worldwide. Peace of mind is gold and silver. Now is the time to invest in gold. When it comes to bullion coins, our prices are competitive and the closest to melt. If it's numismatics you're looking for, we have some of the best deals out there. Visit MidasResources.com today or go to Infowars.com and click on the link to see our daily specials. Here's an example of one of our long-term specials we've been offering for more than a year. Two silver dollars from the turn of the last century, plus two powerful films, The Obama Deception and The American Dream. We also add in the book Dishonest Money, all for $72 and free shipping. The most trusted name in precious metals is Midas Resources. Call 1-800-686-2237 or go to Infowars.com. I'm Ted Anderson with Midas Resources. Sources. We are now only entering the edge of a global financial superstorm, the likes of which the planet has never seen. Here in the United States, the private Federal Reserve is giving more than $85 billion of taxpayer money a month to themselves and other offshore foreign banks. And the worst part is, we have to pay the bank's interest on the money we give them. There is now a race between the global central bank mafia cartels to see who can devalue their country's currencies the fastest. We are already seeing big increases in inflation at the grocery store and the gas line. This will eventually lead to hyperinflation. More than a dozen top globalists like George Soros have been buying record amounts of gold while at the same time bad-mouthing it to the public. Don't just listen to what they say. Watch what they do. For more than 6,000 years of recorded human history, gold has been the ultimate hedge against uncertain times and inflation. Before investing in metals, it is important to do your own research and find a reputable company. Midas Resources has the highest Better Business Bureau rating of an A+. Unfortunately, very few precious metal companies can boast that. Midas Resources has assembled one of the most educated, researched, and professional teams of brokers in the industry. The evidence is overwhelming. In uncertain times, gold and silver is safe harbor. Now is the time to invest in gold. Call 800-686-2237 and Midas Resources will make you 10 reasons to own gold absolutely free. No shipping. It's absolutely free. And finally, Ted Anderson wants to challenge you to find any deal that comes close to his two silver dollars at cost with free shipping, with two free films and a book for $72. That's more than $160 value for $72 shipping included. Click the link at Infowars.com to go to the MidasResources.com specials page. Brought to you by MidasResources.com and Ted Anderson the trusted name in precious metals.
All right, Sabelle, you got cut off by the break there. Uh, you were getting to uh, a central point that a week or so ago, and I've seen the video up on your uh, Boiling Frogs website, and be sure and give that full URL out, uh, that you did call for these other intelligence agencies to go public. I was just shocked that Georgia, and it probably was you because you're well-respected worldwide, that Georgia would actually go, yeah, here's the right thing. These guys were CIA. But it's got to grind on people in intelligence agencies who aren't pure evil like you when you're working at the FBI to just watch the, the you know, bin Laden working for the CIA. You're sitting there listening to it. Uh, and they're running drugs, you know, you name it. Uh, weapons. So, so this is about a five-minute segment left. Continue making the central point you were getting to. Right. So the back deal would be, okay, now by with this incident, suddenly we have uh, Chechens and the, these uh, factions within the, <clears throat> within the region caucuses going from freedom fighters to hot terrorists, Al-Qaeda-linked terrorists, and in return for Russia to have free hand to go and do a major house cleanup, which it, has been, uh, it hasn't been doing for a while. I'm talking about a massive operations and go into the region, even though these people are our people that we planted. We do this all the time. This is and this that's how diplomacy fight. works. You know, we'll take our missiles exactly. out if you take your missiles out, or we'll let you kill and, our spies if you let what? us kill your spies. Right, yeah. Alex. And instead of the international communities uh, vilifying Russia, they will be clapping and saying, look, Boston thing happened. We already declared them. We already portrayed mainstream media running the scripts from the State Department as terrorists. So the international community is going to be supporting, especially the United States and EU, Russia's coming uh, crackdown, right? So and I said, and, and, and as part of that, we are going to go and invade Syria. Guess what? We put this information, this analysis out. That interview, I encourage people to go and watch that video report at Boiling Frogs Post. It's 45 minutes, and this uh, we put out about a week ago. Wow. And it basically aces in uh, every single point. So and then now they're saying Syria, Syria has Syria chemical WMD, weapons. We have Syria WMD a la Al-Qaeda, I mean a la Iraq, okay? Bam, it came out yesterday, all right? Two, you look at the breaking news. Russia rounded up 140 people of caucus radical Islamic terrorists. That's breaking news currently, right now, as we speak, first page of Russia Today's channel. So everything that we predicted is basically taking place. Now you wow. compare that to the mainstream media and the alternatives that have gotten bogged down in the semantics and some details, some ridiculous stuff, as it happened with 9-11, they basically lose the entire picture. Instead of looking at the big picture, they are looking at little fragments. And I understand as far as investigative approach goes, people can get clues and put together, but the clues they are giving you, the mainstream media and government, they are not clues. This is, exactly. screen, as you just talked about, contradictory, conflicting, a lot of them false, ever-changing, evolving, devolving, Rather than doing that, we have been presenting the bigger picture and the Boston terror incident basically mm -hmm. uh, facilitated what we are All seeing right. right now and what we're going to be doing. Bell, we got to go to break. We're going to come back and do a little bit more time with you. And I'd like to invite you on the nightly news. I'd like to have my crew either today or Monday show those clips because you did absolutely call it. You were absolutely right. There's no doubt the globalists run Al Qaeda. This is a staged event. out of here and C Bell will be here till about 15 after she's doing like an hour with us on Monday uh, during the InfoWars not only knows I think it's David Knight doing it we're going to show the Brzezinski documents where they lay all this out this plan in 1979 where they've made public statements since then that's why she's so frustrated I can hear it in her voice it's all laid out it's all admitted the globalists run al-Qaeda they created it they're giving them Libya and Syria uh, they'll say Iran is Al-Qaeda, even though it's Shiites. They just have, oh, Muslims are bad. Let's blow up Syria. Oh, 9-11. Uh, you know, let's blow up I Iraq. It, 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 that's how dumb they think you are.
And so she'll be with us this little segment about five minutes into the next. But next Monday, I want to have the crew get clips from the video she talked about at her Boiling Frogs post, where a week before all this came out, she laid it out. Uh, because she was an insider for years listening to this in the caucuses, into the stands, and she knows. I mean, it's all run by the CIA. It's all run by the globalist. So, Seabell, finish up. You've got the floor. Then the guys will take you out to break and interview you in the next segment. And then they've got Syrian Girl on to expose it from another perspective. Uh, but uh, okay. this is just really incredible. Well, so, Seabell, uh, go ahead and finish up. Yeah. Yes. So, as I was saying, with this now, we are going to see a big time international uh, applaud for Russia starting this crackdown uh, uh, operations with the uh, with the factions in uh, Chechnya and in Dagestan region. And again, we need to also watch Georgia very, very closely with this, because about a week before, 10 days before Boston uh, terrorist event, Russia sent uh, the United States a very strong, uh, also simultaneously cryptic message saying we really don't like what you have been doing with Georgia and that is Georgia is in line to become a NATO member and we had this joint um, exercise military exercise with Georgia right there on the border and again if you go to the map and you look at Georgia's borders what you're going to see is you're going to see Dagestan and Chechnya exactly the region that suddenly became the hot region after the uh, incident. So that's extremely important too. As far as Iran uh, goes, I haven't put that analysis out. It's gonna come out on Monday. Uh, I believe as part of this back deal with Russia, we are going to put this whole Iran situation on hold. We're gonna hear a lot of more of these talks with the United Nation and nothing is gonna happen on Iran, at least I would say for a year or, or longer. However, in the next couple of weeks, you're gonna see the finished job with Syria and you're going to see further internal um, domestic crackdown from Russia towards the factions <laughs> in Dagestan and Chechnya. And one other thing I want to talk about, I haven't talked about it before, but for the past several years, what I have been getting both from my sources in Turkey, but also some intelligence sources here, has been the fact that Zawahiri, Ayman Zawahiri, has also been in this region. He is not in Pakistan. He hasn't been residing in Pakistan. And here's one prediction I'm gonna make, a uh, hypothesis. I'm not calling it a theory at this point. The hypothesis I'm gonna put uh, forward here is, uh, we will be hearing about uh, Zawahiri and pursuit of Zawahiri in the region, which again, as they laid the ground with the Boston incident, they made it the hot terror cell, and we're gonna be hearing US pursuing Zawahiri in the region. And I'm saying it today on April 26th here on your show, uh, during your show, Alex. All right, thank you, Miss Edmonds. Uh, I'm Takari Jackson and David Knight filling in for Alex while he's on the road. We'll have you back just in one second on the next side. But first, uh, David Knight, real quick, what do you have? Well, I really appreciate you filling this in, Cibel, because uh, you know we were talking about some details at the beginning of this, and we, sometimes we look at the really close, tiny details like colors of backpacks and mm -hmm. the feasibility of the government story, and and that when we do that, we kind of try to get people to look at this and examine the official story. But what you've done is you've given us a larger context. You know, we were looking at the official story, the, whether there's bombing drills, that sort of thing. You bring it out to the larger picture, and that's okay, really we'll what's be going right on. back after this break. Stay with us. I had tried everything. I'd cut back the amount of food I was eating. I was lifting weights and jogging, but nothing was working. My body was literally starving for minerals and trace elements as well as key vitamins. And as soon as I had that, I immediately could eat half of what I was eating previously and be satisfied. Now, there are hundreds of great products at InfoWarsTeam.com, but I want to point out the three that have helped me lose 37 pounds in just two months. Products like Beyond Tangy Tangerine, Pollen Burst, and Rebound. When I started taking the Tangy Tangerine and other products every day, I lost more than 37 pounds in just two months. Now that's results. I want to challenge my listeners to go to InfoWarsTeam.com and to order just three of their products, and you will see the changes in the way you look, feel, and in your appetite almost immediately. Start your journey to health and wellness today. InfoWarsTeam.com. 
Our guest is Seabell Edmonds. And Miss Edmonds, we definitely want you to get to your other points. But first, can you uh, clarify some of your statements earlier? You know, uh, not everybody carries this third segment. So if you had four minutes, just give us your quick rundown, and then we can get to the other points uh, that you have on this topic. Well, uh Again, uh, I, I don't want to undermine the work, the great work you have done and other people have done in terms of pointing out to all the inconsistencies as they relate to the incident itself. You know, how there was a suspect carrying gun, was he armed, the backpack, as you pointed out, extremely important. It's just all of us together taking those inconsistencies, okay, putting together with the bigger picture, and then following the events as they unfold after the incident, very, very, very similar to 9-11. And, and, and to do that, you know, with a, uh, in, with a logical, cool-headed way. And of course, as with all terror events you have uh, for the government, for the powers, uh, really positive externalities. And what have been, you know, have been the positive externalities here with the incident. And number one, the government uh, and the powers successfully uh, had a test run, a uh, test run for their martial law uh, climate. And they took Boston and they implemented it in a, in a pretty uh, large scale, I would say, considering we were talking about just one teenager, 19 year old on the run. He, ne he has never had paramilitary or military training. And now we are hearing that he was not really armed and we stormed houses, we shut down stores. So unfortunately, this was a very successful drill. This was the real drill for the <laughs> government and for the powers, for the police, the state. And very unfortunate because of the reaction we saw not only during the event, but also afterwards from people in Boston. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I, am, I am really uh, troubled by the fact that the test result shows that our <laughs> nation is ready to be graduated in the, you know, the graduation level of police state. I don't think you can get really any further than that. Absolutely. You know, I think this is David Knight. How are you doing, Seabell? I think that it's... I think it's real important to look at, like you said, the details to see if this is a contrived narrative. But as you just pointed out, they have a domestic agenda that they're after. That is a military martial uh, law type of police state. We saw that very clearly, and we call that from the very beginning. You're bringing in a larger international agenda, which we see also with the uh, war in Syria and that sort of thing. And you provided us information about what you think might be possible motivations. You know, we had a lot of information leaked by the Russian government that the FBI and the CIA were not giving us. And so, uh, you know, kind of you, you talked about that motivation. A lot of people didn't catch, a lot of, lot of uh, stations don't cover the earlier hours. So could you recap that very briefly and just give us a, a quick recap of what you see as Russia's motivation in this in the broader context of the Syrian war coming up? <laughs> Because uh, the three main objectives here have been, number one, we, Russia has been consistently for the past over a year, the biggest obstacle for our invasion of Syria, okay? And to remove that obstacle, uh, and that is Russia, and you're going to see this, especially with this uh, Syria, WMB, a la Iraq, uh, Russia is going to step aside kind of give us the green light saying, fine, I'm not going to be an obstacle, go ahead, invade Syria. For Russia, Russia has been determined to go, I mean, drastically crack down on the factions. And these are our people. These are United States governments. This is the CIA and NATO as part of Operation Gladio that started after the fall of the Soviet Union. That's why we call it the Operation Gladio Plan B in Central Asia and Caucasus, taking uh, various factions, radicalize them, train them, arm them, direct them, and use them as terrorists against Russia. We are doing it to a certain degree in Chinese border of Xinjiang. Some people know this area as Uyghuristan or Turkestan. If you look at the uprisings there, the radical Islamic terror cells, again, right now we are not talking about it. Right now they are freedom fighters. Right now they are the minorities that China is repressing. But one day, maybe based on a deal with China, we will have them, uh, you know, put them on the map as terrorists. But currently Absolutely. they are our guys there. And so for Russia, it's going to be applauded. This news just broke 
Europe, with Russia arresting over 140 radical Islamic terrorists from the region. These are the Dagestan, Chechnya related factions within Russia. And we're going to hear more. We're going to hear U.S. Congress applauding it, U.S. intelligence agencies, U.S. media is going to applaud. And of course, the majority of the Americans who are only exposed to the mainstream media and they are only getting one sided, uh, flat, uh, made up narrative from the mainstream media. Absolutely. They are going to applaud it as well. Again, another unfortunate reality on the ground. You know, when you're talking about that, how in one area now, the Islamic terrorists, who, future Islamic terrorists are now called freedom fighters, just as we've seen mm -hmm. before. And there's a famous quote from Henry Kissinger. He said, we have no permanent interest, permanent allies, only permanent interests. And uh, quite, you know, right now what they're interested in is going to war with Syria. We saw that. Talked about several years ago, and so we need to put that in the broader context. We need to see how they're using these Islamic groups as cutouts, as motivation and justification for their permanent interests. At one point, there are allies, and then there are you know sworn enemies, and we see this happening over and over again. And then domestically, we also need to turn back to Henry Kissinger when uh, it was just leaked uh, with WikiLeaks. His comment said that the illegal we do immediately. The unconstitutional yeah. is more difficult, takes a little bit longer. That's what we see happening domestically. So we need to look at Henry Kissinger for really kind of the backstory of right. uh, what's going on domestically Kissinger. and internationally. You are referring to the great game. And, and I think this is a good point to emphasize one fallacy out there that are that is being emphasized by people like Shore, you know, the ex-CIA, still CIA guy, and a lot of uh, quasi alternatives that pose as alternatives, uh, real alternatives, and that is this whole notion of blowback. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I really caution people against thinking that <laughs> way. Let's say even if 9-11 was a blowback, which it was not, okay, I'm a big believer of that based on all the facts that we have, you would think, okay, you know, fool the government once, U.S. government, shame on them, and fool them twice, shame on the government. You would think that would stop this uh, terror creation uh, through using radical Islam in Central Asia, Caucasus, Xinjiang area of China. We have been continuing this after 9-11. So this whole notion of blowback, I mean, you either have to say all these guys, including Kissinger and Brzezinski and all these neocons and, and CIA, they are so dumb and so naive that they keep doing the same thing. And lo and behold, it blows back right on our face and we get terror events. Or you have to change this notion of blowback, and, and then I urge people to look at the context, to look at the history, to look at the last 35 years, look at this recent event and the analysis we have been putting, and then ask yourself, does it really look like blowback? Because this is like the second tier justification, the first year, okay, you know, the people are saying this was a genuine event, these guys were radical guys who caused the Boston terror. Then you have the second <laughs> tier, uh, tier imposters, imposters who are coming and they are talking about, well, it's blowback and they are coming out already saying, you see, this is what happens when you uh, say, you know, have some joint partnership for a while with some groups in whether it's Chechnya, it comes back and it haunts us. Well, that is as false as the scenario one, the official narrative. It is just the support and again, it's distraction. So I urge people to, to, to remove themselves, again, step back, look at it, and you see that, come on. You know, how right. many blowbacks are we going to have? I mean, nobody's learning here. This is not a blowback as 9-11 was not a blowback. You have to, at some point, say, are the people who want to protect us, are they Keystone cops or are they... Uh, you know, kind of sly like a fox. I mean, you know, that there's, you, you know, they, if they're so incredibly incompetent, uh, that's one argument. Uh, but then the other thing is, as you're pointing out, and, and let's uh, recap for uh, people who are just tuning into this hour. Uh, you're saying this because you worked at the FBI, and as you told Alex, there'd be many times when you would be following somebody and the CIA would come in and basically take you off the case, take people at the FBI off the case. Is that correct? Absolutely. I mean, not once, not twice, not three times. We had valuable suspects right after 9-11 and with the State Department, you know, it's like CIA, aka State Department, stepping in, stepping in and saying, no, uh, we want to deport these guys, send them back. We don't want them to be interrogated. Certain active <laughs> investigations by the FBI's counterterrorism and counterintelligence uh, operations investigations being shut down, completely 
being shut down per pressure from State Department and the CIA. Now, officially, just for the people's benefit, they cite sensitive diplomatic relations, and they, as they cited in my case when they invoked the state secrets privilege, they said if this woman gets to talk, if her case goes through Congress with a hearing or goes through court, it will be detrimental for certain sensitive diplomatic relations the United States has. Of course, people right away jump the gun, and they're just talking about Saudi Arabia or Turkey. And all along, I've been talking about it's not that. It is that a certain FBI investigations, counterintelligence, not counterterrorism investigation, that covered the period 1996 till 2002, dealt with NATO CIA operations in Russia's Caucasus and Central Asia, recruiting, training, radicalizing, arming, making them, turning them into terrorists, okay? To use them against okay, Ms. Edmonds, Russia. Ms. Edmonds, we have to, uh, we have to go to break. Are you available for just a few more minutes? I know uh, your time is, is busy, but can you do sure. a few more let's minutes? Go, let's go to 11.30 my time. We have nine more minutes. All right, great. All right, okay. we'll be right back with Miss Sybil Edmonds, or Sibel Edmonds, excuse me. I'm Jakari Jackson, David Knight for the Alex Jones Radio Show. You understand how dark it is? How far down the line we are? How late it is? Our guest is Sibel Edmonds. Now, Miss Edmonds, I have a question for you. Earlier when you were talking to Alex, you mentioned that uh, the CIA was very interested in uh, the older brother, uh, of course, referring to the Boston bombing suspects. Why was he so ideal and what does the CIA look for when they're recruiting? Sure. Uh, let me give a personal example of how, how they recruit. And a lot of times CIA recruits under the label State Department. Uh, in 1997, while, while I was pursuing my degree in George Washington University, one of my professors, okay, mm -hmm. uh, after class asked me to stay behind and said, look, you know, with your languages, Turkish, Farsi, other Turkic languages such as Azerbaijani and and uh, having multiple passports, etc., you would be an ideal uh, candidate for the State Department. And I know they are very interested in having you work for them. Okay. And what it was that I found out, basically, it was through State Department, it was the CIA. Because Look, you uh, you when you have the linguistic abilities, okay, you know the religion, or you know the the, the target religion, which is Islam. Uh, you look the part. Well, that is the perfect CIA operatives for that part of the world, whether it's the Middle East or Central Asia and Caucasus. I mean, you get a John Doe with blue eyes and blonde and a thick American accent and no language. Come on. You know, these people can be easily identifiable and people around the world, they have, they know by now that, okay, through our embassies, with we spy through our NGOs, which is for Central Asia Caucasus for Russia. This is why uh, Russia shut down all these U.S. NGOs. That's the number one CIA grounds for operations. And that is both the terror operations, but other operations as well in, in this region, uh, Russia and Central Asia through NGOs. So Russia was very smart with shutting down these NGOs because these NGOs are all a la CIA. Uh, so again, people there, they know that that's the fact. So they watch out. So what is the best way for the CIA to have people on the ground to do the work, to, uh, to take care of some of the operations, yet blend in? you know, yet not raise that much suspicions. And and you have to also look at the nationalistic aspects of people within the region too. No matter what, even if let's say they hate Russia, they are wary of the United States. They know that, okay, United States supporting them or asking them or training them or, or, or carrying out operations with them, it's not for the best benefit of those factions, those minority groups, those uh, Islamic cells within the region. It is for the United States benefits. So they tend to trust people who look like themselves, you know, they have, they share the religion with, they share the language with. Therefore, uh, they are very active. This is the CIA within the university campuses, and I believe that's where they recruited the older brother. That's the likely place. I'm not putting it as bad as I'm putting it as a highly likely possibility, as it occurred in my case. And he would be the ideal C 
CIA operative candidates there, a conduit to further certain things that will be much easier to do with uh, your average John Doe Americans. And same thing is true with Afghanistan, with all over Middle East. We do that a lot. And number one recruitment places are the universities, the college campuses here in the United States. Absolutely. He fits more the profile of that type of person than he does a terrorist uh, because of his... Uh family relationships, and like you said, the multiple languages, that sort of thing, and even the lifestyle that he's living. I mean, no, it's, uh, as Alex had talked about it, very secular lifestyle. Now, you know... Carrying Russian passport, that's extremely important. Carrying yes. Russian passport is very, very, very important. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I'm looking at uh, the uh, bio for uh, your book here, Classified Woman, the Seabell Edmonds story. And one thing really stuck out at me uh, here, it says, having lived under Middle East dictatorships, Edmonds knows firsthand what can happen when government is allowed to operate in secret. I think, you know, so many times we've talked to people who have lived under foreign dictatorships, whether they're coming from uh, Eastern Europe or uh, some other place. And those are the people who see the hallmarks of what's happening here. And I think that's basically what gives you the guts to uh, speak out on this, that, that, that maybe an American would look at the same situation that you saw. And an American would say, this could never happen in America. This is America. This can't happen here. You've lived under it. We've seen other people who've come here from Poland, from Germany, from other places, and they say, we've lived under it too, and we see it happening and being repeated here. Absolutely. I mean, you aced it there because um, the reason the, this is the reality for the Americans, number one, of course, is the mainstream media. When you look at Hollywood, even when you look at the textbooks, the uh, history books in the United States, universities, high schools, it all has this illusion of, you know, like during the World War II with Hollywood. When yeah. American soldiers come, they hand out Hershey bars, you know, and well, then the you. people are throwing flowers, you're liberating us, liberating Absolutely. us, love you, love you. Ask yourselves, what are you doing in this time of great challenge? What are you doing to unlock minds?